morning, everyone, and welcome to yet another interesting and uh, topical <clears throat> webinar hosted by the IADSA, and particularly within our forums department. We are hosting our event today thanks to the Board Governance Forum um, that is, uh, we'll be talking about the critical process of director due diligence. I'm going to now invite my panelists to turn on their microphones and their, um, well, turn on their cameras, microphones for later. Um, we will be going through our discussions today to talk about the critical process of director due diligence. This event is based on a paper produced by the forum, and um, we're going to give it from both perspectives, both the company as well as the individual who may be looking for looking at accepting a board appointment. <clears throat> I've got a, a great panel today with lots of um, long-term experience and knowledge, and um, I'm going to introduce them all. First of all, I'm going to, um, I'm going to introduce uh, Anton van Weyck. He is the chairperson of the Board Governance Forum. He is also a partner at PwC, a member of the King Committee and a Chartered Director. Richard Foster joins us um, in from Cape Town. He's a, an independent non-executive director and chairman on various boards. He's a Chartered Governance Practitioner and a Chartered Director. He's a member of the King Committee, an IODSA facilitator, and a member of the Board Governance Forum. <clears throat> Richard also reviewed this paper or wrote this paper. Um, uh, so he will be talking, taking us through the contents of that paper. Um, Mula Makoba Amagashi um, is a managing partner, partner at Drayton Glendower and leads the executive search at board and C-suite level. Um, and then our fourth panelist will be Millard Arnold. Millard is a non-executive director on various boards, both listed and non-listed companies, advisory board chairperson at the Rhodes University Business School, and a senior consultant at, at Bowman's. <clears throat> so I'd just like to welcome everyone here. Um, and I'm going to hand over to Anton. But just before we hand over, I just want to quickly remind everyone of some um, housekeeping. We have a nice chat function. Uh, we, I would like everyone to post and say hello and you're welcome to greet everyone and say where you're from, but the chat function is if you want to post things. Just remember, if you want to have a side conversation to keep it constructive and um, uh, listen to everyone's views, <clears throat> and then if you want to post a question to our panelists, we do have a Q&A function um, where you can post your questions. Just keep in mind that um, if we don't, because uh, we do have quite a number of participants today, and that may result in quite a number of questions. If we don't get to your um, questions for whatever reason, we will try and answer it via email afterwards, um, but hopefully we'll get to everyone's questions. I'm gonna hand over now to Anton um, to take it away. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you, Julie, and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you again for joining this session. Uh, Julie mentioned the Board Governance Forum, and it is, it's a forum um, of IOD members. Uh, um, what we do is we kind of keep an eye open to global developments, particularly in the governance arena. Uh, we, we obviously seek out any particular topics from our local, local governance um, platforms. Uh, we consider the King Code and anything that we need to, to develop papers on in regard to the King Code. And we also listen to our members and, and the IOD members and, and understanding what, what is their need uh, and what papers would serve them best. And, that's, and then once we've got those topics, we debate them and then we prepare a paper such as the one you're going to hear about again this morning. Um, as Julie mentioned, uh, we, we are looking at the, the, the concept of director due diligence. Um, and, I, and I suppose just in, in kicking this off, you know, the, the whole board appointment process is a two-way contract. Directors will choose the companies they want to work on and work for. Uh, likewise, an organization will, will decide through their nominating committee which of those, which directors suit the culture of that of that organization. So that two-way street. Um, the other the other issue really is is you know directors want to trust the chairman, they want to trust key members of the board, they need to understand how that board operates culturally and operationally. Uh, they also want to want to make sure that the CEO and the CFO are able and willing to share key business information with them prior to, to taking on a role. I think also, if we look at it from an from a, a, a organization's point of view, they, they want clear and sound comfort from, from those directors 
uh, with regard to um, you know ma them making positive contributions to the organization and obviously adding value to to their ambitions. So what we're going to hear from this morning from these three our three panelists. First, we're going to have Richard talking to us about the paper, just giving a little bit of, of insight into the paper itself and his and his comments on the paper and what what he sees and particularly in the uh, the board or well, the director market, so to speak. Uh, Mula will then take us through her views from an executive search perspective and what what they will look for from their their organization's point of view with regard to those directors, the strengths, the weaknesses, uh, and in particular in matching an individual to an organization, as I said earlier on, from a, from a cultural point of view. And then Millard is going to take us through the, the candidate's perspective. So what does a candidate look at uh, before they take on a role of, of director in an organization? Once we've finished with these, these uh, brief introductions, we're going to go into a Q&A session. You're welcome to ask any of the panelists uh, questions that uh, you, you believe are, are, are pertinent to this particular topic. Uh, and as Julius mentioned, please use the Q&A function, which is at the bottom of your screen next to the participants. And I see we are now at 155 participants. So thank you all very much for taking the time this morning to attend this session. So with that, Richard, I'd like to hand over to you to give us an overview of the, the paper itself. Thank you. Thank you, Anton, and uh, good morning to, to everybody that's joined us. And uh, right from the outset, without going down and sort of uh, negative or rabbit holes, uh, I just thought there was a comment or statement made by Spencer Stewart, the executive search consultants in 2002. And uh, quote unquote, the governing body is the one body with the power to most influence the organization is often randomly selected, really critically evaluated, and almost never held accountable. I mean, we are seeing, uh, you know, the uh, so-called move to hold more uh, boards or board members accountable, however slow the, uh, the process. The uh, evaluations of board is a separate topic, but what I want to focus on is often randomly selected. So what happens from a company perspective and from an individual uh, perspective, because you know, as Spencer Stewart quite rightly says, this is the body that actually really can influence the organization or should influence the, the organization. As, uh, you know, uh, Anton's uh, alluded to, uh, he's really spoken about, you know, what the paper at a high level is going to cover. But I mean, the purpose really was to look, as I say, from both a governing body perspective, you want to get the right people into the boardroom, and then from an individual perspective, you don't want to step into the wrong boardroom. And it's quite easy to do that. And I'll talk a little bit more around that and the uh, risks in that regard, as will some of the other speakers. So again, uh, there was a due diligence paper. You know, the same question was asked for King, why another King? Uh, why a revision of the uh, paper? And that's what this is. And if you look at corporate governance, I mean, it's dynamic. What was good 20 years ago, 10 years ago, or 15 years ago, the environment's changed. We, we've had learnings, or we should have taken uh, learnings from uh, various uh, aspects. If you look at the evolution of the King Code from one to uh, four, you know, we started off talking about systems and processes as a definition. King three, we started talking about, we need effective leadership at board level. That was the definition of King. King four, we need ethical and effective leadership. And that's what the, uh, the paper is focusing on. Well, what are ethical and effective leaders? How do we actually uh, zone in uh, on that? And I mean, the relevance of the, uh, the paper, I think, is uh, so well highlighted or reinforced by Chief, well, now Chief Justice uh, uh, Zondo. And uh, if you read the uh, read four parts of uh, the uh, Commission of Inquiry, I mean, he highlighted or reinforced there's a dearth of both competent directors or was on boards. And if you looked at the boards as well, there was no, well, ethical and effective leadership in many instances was severely lacking. So again, that's the backdrop against uh, which this, uh, this paper is written and what we uh, you know, are trying to achieve through it. 
Um, if you look again at the evolution of uh, governance and you look at particularly, uh, say, the evolution from King 3 to King 4, the terminology changed. We use terminology in, uh, in King 3 like companies and directors and immediately, well, you know, King's aspirations were broad, but to cover all organizations immediately push back, well, you know, we uh, counselors or we trustees, so, you know, King doesn't really apply. And the terminology was updated to provide for generic uh, terminology, organizations, governing body members, and that's the terminology you'll see if you read the paper that's also been, been brought through in the uh, paper. So one of the sort of real evolutions in this paper was to fully align with current uh, corporate governance best practice, i.e. King 4 and whatever else was out there. And I'll talk about, a little bit more about some of the, the other learnings that were pulled into the paper. So dealing with a company perspective first, you've got Annex A, and I'll unpack that for you uh, uh, briefly a little later. And principle seven, relates to, for those of you who have read King, relates to the composition of the, uh, the governing body. And it talks about balance of knowledge, skills, experience, diversity, and independence. And uh, it's up to the board to think about you when they're recruiting a director. So what do we need on this board? Do we need knowledge? Do we need skills and experience? Do, does diversity need increasing? What about the independence aspect? And uh, what we've done with the paper as well, extracted learnings from the Chartered Director of South Africa Key Competency uh, Framework. And that's based on uh, three axes, so to speak, knowledge, skills, and experience. And uh, unpacking that further, it's not enough just to look at technical competencies today. Do we need a lawyer on board? Do we need a chartered accountant? What are the functional competencies? Sure. What are the personal competencies uh, we need to bring in? And social competencies. And I'm sure Mula will talk uh, more to that, uh, you know, from a uh, search consultant uh, perspective. So let's say Annex A covers the key issues of focus. Then we turn it around and say, well, I'm a director. So what about from a personal perspective? You know, I want to be a non-executive director. I mean, uh, I found it interesting. There seems to be a romanticism around um, being a uh, non-executive director until sometimes you, you finish a workshop or a lecture on the uh, potential liability or risks for a director. And, you know, somebody turns around and says, is this really what I'm signing up for? But uh, so you want to be a non-exec, <coughs> excuse me. One of the things you need to realize is that the board acts as a team or a collegiate, but you owe your legal duties to the company individually. But having said that, you can be held jointly or severally liable. So, you know, be careful who your friends are. <laughs> or uh, when I say friends, I'm talking about friends in the boardroom or colleagues or associates. Be careful of the company uh, you keep, uh, uh, so to speak because you could be caught up in that. So it's equally important to actually provide guidance to directors. So if I'm looking at uh, a board, what are the key things I should worry about if I could be uh, tainted? And I mean, just on, uh, you know, personal liability and being caught up in a, uh, you know, in the uh, uh, collective decision or uh, in what the so-called team did, have a look at, uh, you know, Zondo again with Eskom. The entire 2014 board has been recommended for further investigation and uh, potential prosecution, the entire board. So uh, as I say, it's hugely important from a personal perspective to give guidance. And that's what this paper does. If you go into, uh, if you go into it and have a look, it shows you the areas, the things you should look at, whether it's minutes, whether it's the board evaluation, and such like. Find out as much as you can about that organization. What are you getting yourself into? Who, who's in that? Who's the shareholders? Stakeholder matters. Again, some guidance there because we've seen the challenging space for people who appointed by a stakeholder. Well, you know, my, my boss appointed me who's uh, 
you know, in the uh, holding company, I'm giving one example in a group situation, or in the, uh, the public sector, who do you play for? The law is clear on where your duty is owed, but uh, this becomes a difficult uh, uh, an area because there are challenges around role clarity. The company that appointed you or the person that uh, nominated you or appointed you as a, uh, a director uh, to this particular company, do they understand your duties and uh, your role? The information flow, again, hugely critical. What are you allowed to divulge? What aren't you? And uh, this, I'll talk more about it uh, shortly. There's a uh, specimen uh, confidentiality agreement there. But that flow of information as a director to the uh, stakeholder, hugely, uh, it's hugely challenging, complex area, and needs to be appropriately uh, dealt with so you don't breach your, uh, uh, your duty of confidentiality. The other thing, just with the uh, uh, representative director, there is a separate paper, it's referred to in this particular paper on the representative director, we'll have a look at it. Uh, we then talk about uh, regulated uh, organizations, perhaps, you know, the, your company is regulated by the JSE or the FSCA, so what are some of the key issues they would look at, fit and proper, uh, independence, so do you feel as a director that uh, you fit those requirements? If you're recruiting people, do you believe that they fit uh, those requirements that the regulators uh, require? It's a lot more focused from the regulators on who is uh, recruited uh, onto the, the board. And then uh, I mentioned to you from the perspective of confidentiality of uh, information and uh, NHC is a sample and gives guidance on the uh, on a contract to protect both ways. And if you have a look at the uh, the legal environment today, uh, you looking for more information on a company, you want to look at minutes, you want to look at board evaluations, you want to look at other confidential documents. But uh, again, you've got uh, legislation in place. Uh, think about uh, papaya. So what are the issues in that regard? So uh, what we've provided, uh, as I say, is an annexure, which just assists with, this is what a confidentiality uh, agreement should uh, look at, and I'll deal with that again um, shortly. If we then unpack annexure A in a little bit more detail from a company perspective, I've already covered, you know, knowledge, skills, <coughs> excuse me, experience, personal attributes of the uh, candidate. What are the things we want to uh, look at? But then what are, the, what are the other aspects, other considerations such as this individual, do they bring a rep reputational risk to the organization? Uh, you know, who else are they involved with? What other companies are they involved with? Uh, what is their background? And again, uh, sorry, Mula, I'm putting you on the, the spot, but I'm sure you'll be talking about utilizing uh, the power of information technology or particularly social media in this uh, regard and what you can uncover around that. And as I say, the, the paper specifically uh, uh, talks about that aspect and to actually leverage from that and understand who are you uh, putting on the board or conversely, uh, you can find out a huge amount in the public domain about the organization that uh, you're interested in joining or you've been nominated by your uh, stakeholder to join. And you say, well, you know, thanks, but no thanks. Uh, this is a, uh, you know, a really good opportunity from you, but um, I don't particularly want to play in that space because, you know, the personal risk we've seen again is uh, hugely uh, high. And it's not only if you're caught up in a, uh, you know, or caught from a, a legal perspective, I mean, to be dragged through the, uh, the courts, whether or not, you know, you've uh, tried to do the right thing on a board is not a nice place to be. The reputational risk while all this is happening, I mean, is hugely uh, damaging to, to people. We've seen that in a number of instances, use Steinhoff as an example. Um, you know, once you're tainted on one board, uh, most boards will turn around, well, generalizing, but say, well, we don't really think, uh, you know, that it does us any good from a reputational perspective to now have you on the, the board. 
So uh, from an individual point of view, understand the strategy of the company or try to understand, particularly, you know, in the new world, again, you look at the evolution of governance, strategy, purpose. What is the purpose of this organization? Do they have a proper strategy, the risks and opportunities? Do they play into environment and social aspects? Do I believe it's a board that actually even understand this? What type of, you know, company is it from uh, that point of view? What, what drives that company? And from strategy and the, the risks, you can normally start to uh, perhaps understand the culture that pervades in the organization. Are we on a, you know, am I joining a company where the strategy is just uh, achieve your target? You know, that's your target. Uh, we don't care how you achieve it, but uh, we want the numbers. Is that the type of organization, particularly if you look at the, uh, you know, what's expected today in terms of uh, best practice governance from an ESG perspective, the financial aspects around the company, where is this company? Are you joining a company that's, I mean, take uh, Comair as an example, if they were resurrecting and you were asked to join that board, or you're joining a board, you know, that's in a difficult situation. Uh, do you understand the uh, financial implications? Is it about to go into, uh, or should it be uh, recommended for uh, business rescue? Are you going to join a board that, uh, is uh, is distressed and uh, perhaps uh, you're going to join a board that or a company that's trading recklessly these are the things you need to uh, think about governing body composition also from a personal perspective why why have you been offered this board appointment uh is it a case of window dressing and when i say window dressing well you know we've got to comply with this uh, uh king uh code and uh, regulation we need three independent directors or an independent chair you know are you interested that was a message once left on my uh, uh, answering machine or voicemail and if you start to think well why do they actually want these people on the board will i be able to fully discharge my duties as an independent director so you look at that uh, come, you look at the governing body composition, how will I fit in? What is my suitability to fit in on that board? Or is it going to be a case of somebody I asked the question back to uh, the late uh, Tony uh, Dixon? Why did you join the SAA board, Tony? You're crazy, you wouldn't have gone near it. He said, no, I thought I would be doing a good thing. But he said, I became known as, you know, Mr. Dissension. So these are things you need to understand. What is the company about? Particularly that uh, board composition, who else is in there? And uh, some of the other things mentioned in the paper, you know, the, uh, the structure of the company, are we part of a group? Who calls the shots? Is it the holding company that calls the shots? Who are the key stakeholders? Who's driving this, car, this company? What are the tensions with the stakeholders? Or what are the... Uh, uh, what are the uh, competitive advantages from the stakeholders? Where does the company stack up? Does the board or the company, from what you can glean, even know who its stakeholders are? Is it something that's focused on? Do they realize the value of uh, stakeholders? So all these things, uh, you know, I'm really talking about uh, best practice uh, governance, and that's what the paper's done, is align uh, the focus and the, uh, the relevant questions. Uh, also covers things like, what well, I've mentioned, financial issues, the governance issues, uh, how many meetings do they have? Do they have proper meetings? You know, are they, have they got a proper company secretary or governance services professional in, uh, in place? Do these look like proper governing body meetings? What does the board evaluation say? Anton uh, alluded to, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the chairman and the CEO. Can you pick up from either the minutes or the board evaluation? Have you got a strong chair? Have you got a weak chair? Is the CEO the uh, dominant uh, person? And I say you can normally pick this up from a so-called desktop study where you, you ask for certain information. So having said all that, Annex C, as I say, provides this sample of a uh, confidentiality agreement because we want to encourage uh, people to look for, utilize the as much information as possible. And uh, that confidentiality agreement, I mean, it's very uh, high level, it's just a guide, 
and uh, get legal advice or your legal counsel to have a look at the final document you put in place because it's important to protect yourself. And obviously, if you're a company and you have a uh, confidentiality agreement, I would assume that you know you've already got the advice on what needs to be uh, put in place to protect yourself as a company from somebody looking at something and then. I mean, this is hugely sensitive information that uh, people are looking at, you know, generally only what a, a director would see. So uh, make sure you, you know, you've got your ducks in a row from that perspective. And then the, the last uh, annexure, uh, annexure D, uh, SIPC, the Disqualified Director Register, and there's a neat little roadmap of uh, how to access this register. And right from the outset, I've, uh, I've never actually, from a practical point of view, done it. But uh, as I say, there, there's a roadmap there, and we're sure this is the, the way you do it. And it is possible to, as I say, get in on the internet and see, well, who has been uh, disqualified as a uh, director? Who is on that register? So from my side, that's, uh, that's pretty much it. And uh, what I will do is hand over to uh, Muna to take us into the really interesting stuff. And what do they look for when they uh, recruit uh, directors? So thank you. Over to you, Muna. Thank you, Richard. So I think um, what I was going to talk about has really been touched on quite a bit by Anton and Richard. But I will look at it from two perspectives. I think firstly, from a client perspective, because typically by the time clients come to us, it's a grudge purchase. They've tried on their own. Uh, there've been some challenges. And so a client will come and present with a problem. We have a company that's in distress. We are looking for men and women with this particular skill set. We operate in a particular sector and industry, which has its peculiarities. And we're looking for men and women to serve in particular roles on this board. So as an example, the client could come and say we're in the regulated sector and I'll use financial services as an example. Um, and why I tend to use financial services is that the regulation within financial services, not just at board level at, and in industry level, but also um, with the Reserve Bank is quite stringent. So the fit and proper test becomes a critical success factor in us supporting clients in finding best men and women to join a banking board or any financial services board. And they would come to us with a role spec. So the spec would say we're trying to attract a chairman uh, who's going to then be dedicated to this board. And particularly within financial services, if you look at a chairman, it's normally a, a quite a long tenure. So board tenure is normally nine years. Um, and within financial services, as an example, um, about 70% of your time has to be dedicated to that board if you're taking on the role as a chairman of a board. So quite onerous in terms of uh, fit and proper, but also onerous in terms of your responsibilities and your dedication and time to serve as a chairman of a particularly listed financial services organization. And then obviously the sector is one issue, but also the listed regulations are another. So inevitably you have a whole lot of hoops that you've got to run through just in terms of your sector experience, regulated or unregulated, what sector it is, um, and the time that's required for you to serve on the particular board. And then, then clearly, if it's not a chairman, it may be a chairman of a subcommittee. Um, and those subcommittees vary, but there, there's some of them that are quite standard, where there's audit and risk, REMCO, uh, social and ethics, uh, investment and strategy. Um, and so depending whether you're just a proper member or whether you're chairing that subcommittee, that obviously requires a certain skill set. So in terms of that skill set, you would need to come with a set of domain skills or expertise. So the client would say, if we're in the banking sector and we're looking for somebody to join a listed board, we need them to have prior experience of working in the sector because generally financial services requires a lot more detailed experience and it, it's an advantage to have worked in the financial services sector. It's not exclusive, but it's an advantage. And so the client would come to us with a smorgasbord and say, this is what we'd like. And then they overlay on top of that race, gender, inclusivity, um, and then there's the issue of independence. So is this man or woman independent enough to represent shareholders or represent themselves on the board as an independent and not be subjective in terms of their perspectives um, as a governing member of this organization? What's also become quite um, common these days is the whole issue of what I call overboardedness. So do they have enough time 
to serve on this board? How many boards do they currently have? What sectors are those in? How onerous are their responsibilities? Um, so overboardedness in the sense that usually in this part of our world, four boards maximum is what we think is doable. If you're doing this exclusively as an independent board member, um, in the Middle East, um, it can be anything between four and eight, um, and that's another topic for another conversation. Uh, but generally, in our part of the world, we kind of look at three or maximum four. If you have a financial services board as one of those, then the number could actually be less than that, um, because I think the Reserve Bank is quite clear about how much time they want board members to be able to be available to serve on the banks of boards. Um, and then shareholders are becoming quite active in terms of their uh, views around who gets onto a board. So when we get a brief from a client um, for a board is typically from the chairman because it's the chairman's responsibility to build their team. It's their responsibility to, to manage and, 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 and review the performance of the team. And I talk about the team of the board in its entirety. Um, that team is made up of sub teams and those sub teams are subcommittees and it's their role to manage the performance of that particular team. Um, and so we look at then what skills they have, what responsibilities they'll have, what risks. Um, I think Richard and Anton talked about risk being a big issue in deciding to join a board. And then from our perspective, we also looked at tenure, conflict and availability. So how long are you going to be on the board for? Um, are you a new board member? Because a new board member takes a little longer to get up to speed the first three years you typically attend um, if, it's a, if it's your first board, but you may not necessarily be contributing as effectively as you should. There's issue of conflict. You can't serve on a conflict, you know, on a conflicting board. Um, so conflict becomes a big issue. And then availability is important. Are you available? Are you, do you have the time to spend on it? Um, and so those are some of the, the challenges that clients come to us with. And then from a candidate's perspective, um, I think these are some of the questions when you do your diligence, you should be asking yourself your due diligence. Why me? Um, what skill set do I possess? What domain expertise do I possess? Uh, how much time do I have to dedicate to this particular task, which is quite onerous and potentially quite risky? Um, in terms of my skill set, uh, what commercial skill set do I have I got? Uh, what technical skill set do I possess? And I think for me, the, the, the general rule is, you're qualified to sit on a board when you have a proven sustainable track record of success in your particular area of expertise. And I think proven and sustainable are key words to remember in the sense that the management team is going to look to you to help guide, challenge and support. And if they cannot learn from you, um, my personal view, if you don't have any scars where you can with credibility uh, talk to your fellow board members and the executive team about when I tried this in this particular sector, when I ran this particular business, uh, if I came with these particular technical skills, these are some of the things to look out for. These are some of the loopholes that could lie ahead. These are some of the risks that you th should think about. I think you come confidently to a board with a skill set when you have a track record of sustainable proven success. And then I think your sector experience is important because coming onto a board, I think if you want to be an effective board member, and you're asking yourself the why me questions, is what do I bring to this board that's going to advantage the board, but this is going to advantage the management team? Um, how do I then earn my respect on day one in terms of my sectors, my skills, my scars, um, in the sense that my job here is to both to support and to challenge the management team. Um, and I think what was talked about before as well is you need to look at the board composition of the team. So who am I going to be serving with? What records do they have? Um, and track record, not just in terms of their stellar careers, but their values um, and, and, and their way of, of managing crises. And I think one of the areas that I don't think we spend too much time on around board is boards spend a lot of time managing potential crises or reacting to crises that have, have befallen organizations and industries. And so I think crisis management and your ability to work um, in a highly um, um, visible environment, because as the board, you're quite visible in the sense that at the end of the year, your name goes on the annual report and the integrated annual report, and you really have to stand by the decisions that management made that you supported them through and you challenged them through. And it's not just when things are going well, but it's particularly when things are in a very challenging environment. So your style, your temperament, uh, the ability to manage conflict, 
Um, I always look at successful boards, in my view, are boards that when you look at the experience and the tenure of the chairman and how he or she manages to lead an organization that's in distress, I think that typically filters down to finding a, a board that has high EQ, but also a board where discourse and dialogue is promoted in a way that fosters transparency, where the management team don't feel they have to hide anything from the board, where the management team is clear that the board is going to support us as much as it's going to challenge us. And I think that lies a lot on the desk of the chairman in terms of how they lead that board. And, so, and secondarily, it also falls on the chairmen's or chairpersons of the subcommittees. So each of those really have to have a high level of intellect, a high level of experience, um, and then the style of how they manage to get the work done at subcommittee level in support of the executive team. And then I think performance of the organization, consistent performance is important, but not just performance in terms of the results or the share price, but performance in terms of how that organization is rooted in society. And I think the whole focus globally around ESG is beginning to give deep, um, um, focus, for lack of a better word, but companies are really beginning to look at how they position themselves as solid citizens and how they look after uh, the world that we live in. And so ESG has become a critical area of focus, particularly from an executive search perspective. It's an evolving competency. It's a growing competency. It's a very critical competency, both at board level and senior executive level. Um, and I think Richard talked about it before, I think one of the areas we need to look into is also the tenure of the executive team. Uh, I have a view that CEOs that have been there, in my view, 10 years plus, uh, particularly the company's been performing consistently very well in terms of the share price. Somehow, I think that's an area that needs to be looked at quite carefully because sometimes you can find the CEO is a CEO in title, but actually performing as a chairman um, unofficially. And, and then the, the tail wags the dog. And I think those are areas that you need to look at as well in terms of uh, the executive team tenure and particularly the culture, style and personality of the chairman. Uh, whereas, um, and then there's brand and reputation. So the brand and reputation of the organization, uh, its citizenship and corporate citizenship uh, in terms of its broader stakeholder base, are they a big emitter? Are they a big polluter? Are they completely uh, disconnected from the realities of the communities that they serve? Um, and inclusion and diversity. So I think Richard talked about the fact that is this just a tick box approach? And I think when you look at, am I prepared to serve on a board? You need to look at some of the areas around what analysts have said, what shareholders have said, what is the board composition? How long have other fellow board members served on the board? Um, board evaluations. So each board member should get evaluated regularly. The board itself should get evaluated regularly. The subcommittees of the board should get evaluated regularly. And when you're at a very advanced stage of joining a particular board, this is information that you can ask for. This is information that you should ask for in terms of conducting your own due diligence. Um, and then for yourself as well, you need to kind of introspect and look at your ability to contribute maturely, your ability to communicate clearly when you're on a board, your ability to understand that your job is not there to outsmart the management team. Your job is not there to catch out the management team. Your job is there to do two things, is to support the management team as well as challenge them, but to create an environment of transparency, of trust, where robust debate can take place. Um, and your role is really there to help the board go from good to great. And it will not always be smooth sailing. Um, I think you're tested mostly when boards are going through a, a difficult time. And COVID was a great test for how boards potentially got overly involved in businesses. And that divide between supporting and guiding at arm's length um, and this global pandemic hits and boards got drawn into a lot of operational issues. Um, and there's some research we did with INSEAD about three years ago on that very, two years ago on that very issue. And the results are very interesting. So we are, I think after COVID, we're going to have to recalibrate again to make sure that boards are not getting overly involved in operational issues um, and are able to stand back and let the management team do what they need to do. And boards are there to provide oversight, manage support, manage risk on behalf of shareholders and stakeholders. Um, yeah, so I'll hand over to Millard. Malad, you're on mute. If you want to just unmute yourself. Thank you. 
thank you, Mula. Um, one of the, I guess, advantages or disadvantages, depending on how you see things, to be the last person on a panel like this is there's been a fair amount of discussion about many of the issues that any individual looking to serve on a board would have to address or face. Um, Richard, I think if it hasn't been said before to you, um, you should be commended on the document that you have prepared because it is an extremely important, useful document for anyone who is considering joining a board or for any organization that is looking to attract new board members. I must say I've had the pleasure of serving on uh, as a non-executive director, as an executive director on companies large and small, on private uh, nonprofit organizations. Um, and in many instances, um, it would have been extremely helpful at the time that I was asked to join, had I had uh, before me this kind of guidelines to help me in determining what boards make sense and what are the kinds of things that I should be mindful of in taking on the assignment. Um, I particularly like the way that you've prepared this paper. Um, and whilst as an individual looking at joining a company, it depends in many instances on how you were approached to join the company. Um, in the case that um, someone like Mula approaches you and says that they are looking to find uh, a non-executive director for whatever company or sector it is, um, that's one approach. More often than not, certainly in my case, it has been that I've been approached by either someone on the board itself, the nominating committee or the chairman of the board and asked if I would be willing to serve as a non-executive director. And, and, and it may not seem like an important point, but for me, I think over time, I've learned that it is. Um, because if you are approached by someone that you know uh, as someone once put it to me in terms of a board that I was being asked to, to join and subsequently chair, it was said to me that you should, um, you should realize that when your peers come to you and ask you to join, it is a sign of the confidence that they have in you and their belief that you're the kind of person that could take them to the next level. Well, that's all very flattering, um, but it does make it difficult in some ways to, to say no to people, particularly if it's individuals that you've worked with in the past and have known and respect. Um, and again, this checklist or guidelines would have been very useful under those circumstances, because although you, you, you have this relationship with whomever has asked you to, to consider joining a board, being able to walk through with them, if that's the case, uh, the guidelines that you feel are important for you to, to share with them the thinking behind why it is that you would either want to join or not join would be extremely important. So an example of that, of course, is your first section under, um, under section one, looking at strategy. Um, and now on, on, the, on one level, if it's a company that you know something about um, and you know the person who's involved in that uh, company, you may well have a fairly good sense of the strategy that they are employing and you would be perhaps aware of the activities that they're engaged in, particularly if it's a company that's listed or a company that, that you follow because of the industry sector it's in. You may, be well, you may be well aware of what the strategies are that the company is pursuing. But as Mula has pointed out, one of the, the questions you have to ask yourself is what kind of expertise do I bring to this board and what value will I add and how will the company benefit from the, uh, the insights that I might have and how can I help that company realize its objectives? 
So whenever I've looked at joining a board, that has been one of the critical questions I've asked myself. Well, what am I going to contribute here? What is the role that I play? I'll come back to that a bit later on because that does raise some questions in my own minds about the composition of boards and some of the committees that make up those boards. But I think if you have a well, if you have a, a well-placed understanding of what it is that the company is seeking to do and what it is that you might be able to add, it goes a long way in helping you understand what value you can make to the company's objectives. Now, I mentioned, uh, if, I, if I might just step back and offer a, a parenthetical, how you get asked to join a board. One of the boards, some of the boards in the past that I've been on, I would have to say was one of the biggest mistakes I've made. And, and I hope I don't offend anyone uh, in the audience who is a party to a board, much like the ones that I am about to speak of. And that is when you're asked to join a board that is dominated or run by a family. Um, I was asked to chair a board once of a family run organization and it, it, it was the most difficult. I ultimately had to resign simply because of the different difficulties that existed within the family and those played out at board levels. And it was impossible to get objective um, strategic understanding of a way forward because of the animosities that were involved and the desire of the members of the family each individually to try and influence you to see their point of view and to adopt their, 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 their perspective on things. And if I've learned one lesson, I think, is to avoid uh, family-run businesses where you particularly are being asked to be not so much a chairperson or a member of the board, but to be a mediator and then sometimes a counselor or a psychologist. But that said, uh, that's not often the case. And um, it's just an insight that from my own experience, I would say, <laughs> if given a choice, I would avoid. Um, Richard, in his, his paper, um, in his guidelines, uh, the second section though, is the section that means a lot to me. And I think to any, any prospective board member, and that is the risk. Uh, the risk section, both the risk that an individual faces in joining that board, but more importantly, the risk that the organization itself faces and how are those risks managed and governed. And, and yes, you can look uh, very closely at the risk register and get some indication of that. But as a lawyer, um, one of the sections that was most important to me in Richard's paper was B18, which he talks about, is there any material litigation presently being undertaken or threatened either by the organization or against it? And in my mind's eye, this is extremely, extremely important if you're considering joining a board to understand what kinds of issues are percolating in the background that may have a diabolical effect on the organization and potentially you as an individual, depending on the level of engagement and time span in which the issue are being played out. Um, I, I Later on in, in the paper, it talks about board composition. And I would say virtually all businesses take place um, against a backdrop of regulatory, in a regulatory environment. Um, there is enormous legal um, and political uh, uh, policy constraints on what it is that a board or a company might undertake to do. And it therefore in my mind's eye raises the question that as you look at a board, that you might join, one of the serious questions you have to ask yourself is, is there a lawyer on that board, who un a commercial lawyer who understands business and understands the kind of issues that the company either will face or can face? Um, and it, it, 
it doesn't have to be that there is a member of the board who is a lawyer. If the company is large enough and it has in-house counsel, if the in-house counsel uh, is not he or she a member of the board, they should, in my view, be at least invited uh, to attend board meetings, if not on all issues, on most issues, where there can be some elucidation of the potential threats that the company faces. And I, I, I once served on a board of a company uh, which uh, spoke about the fact that it was contractor. It was a contractor. And it pointed out that we are contractors, we do contracts. And I asked at one of our board meetings, well, if that's the case, who writes your contracts? Because we had no real appreciation of the role that lawyers play in managing um, con contractual arrangements and understanding the kinds of issues that the company faces, whether they are issues along the lines of exclusive arrangements, or are there questions that are gonna be raised that look innocent to the board in and of themselves about perhaps market allocation or uh, price determination, which may well lead into issues around excessive pricing or price discrimination. Uh, are you a large enough company that what you do is going to lead to issues that may surface around abuse of dominance. All of those are issues that sometimes are innocently played out. And unless there is someone on the board who has an understanding and an appreciation of those kinds of issues, the potential threat that the company faces are large. And those are ones that I, I, I think I, I worry about. Um, one of the other areas that uh, Richard highlighted in the paper, and I'm now scanning down to it, um, is, and it's something Mula also touched on, the governing body composition. Um, what is the current composition of the governing body? Who are the executives and the non-executives? And what are their backgrounds and how long have they served? Now, I, I think this is extremely important as well, because in many instances, as you enter or join a board, these are people you're going to be meeting in some instances for the very first time. You know nothing about them. You have no idea of the kind of dynamics that are at play individually and collectively as a board. So as an example, um, if you are joining a board where one of the board members has been a former CEO, I have found in many instances, it's been difficult for a former CEO to divorce him or herself from the idea that they no longer manage and or run an operating company, but that they are there to, uh, to act as a, a counselor, a governor of the uh, strategic operations of the board in which they now sit. Uh, many uh, CEOs find it difficult to make the transition from not managing to leading. Uh, and so that's important. The other is how many of the former board members are CEO or chairs of other companies, because that too impacts the nature of how they approach uh, the board on which they sit. Some board members in it I have known in the past uh, have always believed that they are still the chairperson. Uh, and it's very difficult for them to step back and be a member of a team. So that's important to understand. And it's difficult to know that because although you can look at uh, whatever you might see on the, um, uh, the, uh, the boards, uh, the annual, annual report or other documents that you may look at who will give you some of the background to the individuals, it will not tell you the dynamics that you will be facing if you join that board. Um, the other issue, again, is the range of skills you bring to the board and what are the skills that are already on that board and how long, uh, I think Mula or Richard may have discussed this, how long have other members been on the board? How long have they worked together? What are the dynamics of it? 
Um, I have served on boards where one of the things that often happens is that uh, contentious issues are dealt with outside of the board prior to the board meeting. Um, and many instances, you as a new board member may not be aware of the dynamics that are taking place. So it may well be that some of the executive board members meet to discuss an issue, work through a strategy that they would like to employ well before the board meeting itself, and you wander in innocently believing that you are participating in an open and transparent meeting. Such is not always the case and you need to be fully aware that there are dynamics at play that do impact some of the decisions that you will be expected to take. And those have implications, as I think Richard had pointed out, down the line in terms of uh, litigation that may uh, be as a consequence of decisions taken by the board. Um, one other area that I thought was important in the guidelines that Richard offered um, was uh, 122, uh, governing body, again, governing body composition. And Mula talked about it as well. Um, when you join a board, particularly if it's a very uh, technical board or one in which your skill set is not particularly um, uh, aligned with, so um, you need to know how are you going to be kept informed of the activities of the board in such a way that you can apply yourself meaningfully to offering the kind of direction that's necessary from a non-executive director. How will you get that information and how is it shared? Um, and then the second part of that is, are you allowed to approach management on your own to ascertain information that you require to help you better understand what it is that the company does? Does that have to be cleared through the board? Uh, is it something that has to be authorized by management? I think it's important to understand how information is made available to you and how you can access information and if it is to be information that is going to be shared, it should be a case that that information is shared equally amongst all executives at all times. So that even if I ask for information as an individual, that information is then made, that request is made known to other board members that um, the newest board member, or in this case, Millard has asked for information on the following, this is our response and this is to keep everyone informed. Um, the other issue I, I, I think was extremely important from my perspective looking at a board is what committees are there and what committees are you expected to serve on, but more importantly in my mind's eye as well is to understand is there an EXCO committee? How is it composed? Is it mandated by the Articles of Memorandum of Incorporation? How long has it been in place? Are the same people, is, are there non-executive directors in the EXCO committee? Uh, what powers does it have? And what kind of, how often does it meet? I, I think knowing something about the EXCO, if there is one, is extremely important because many issues are decided at, at EXCO and they impact on you as a board member and often you are asked to ratify a decision that's been taken by an exco. And uh, depending on the board, the size of the board, the understanding of the chairperson of both the exco and or uh, board at large, that information should be shared either through the minutes or in some kind of a report. But it is important to understand um, how the exco works. I've uh, another committee, which I think is extremely important. It may have been overtaken in, in, in other parts of the world and perhaps even here in South Africa, but that is the social and ethics committee. Um, I've chaired social and ethics committees 
And I fully believe that they are one of the most important tools that a board has, particularly in addressing ethical issues um, and being aware of those issues and being aware that the board has to be aware of those issues. Bringing those questions before the board is the role of the social and ethics committee. It now morphs into what people are calling, well, I shouldn't say people, but what is referred to as ESG. But in South Africa, I think there's been uh, a great deal of attention that we've placed on the importance of the social and ethics committee, which overlaps in my mind's eye to some degree with ESG. The difference is that a social and ethics committee is mandated by law under the Companies Act, whereas an ESG is not. But the fact of the matter is, despite the the need and requirements of a social and ethics committee. I don't think from my limited experience and, and following the boards that I have followed that many companies fully utilize or understand the significance and importance of a social and ethics committee and what it has to add to the overall governance of a board. So I've always regarded that committee as one of extreme importance. Um, Ooh. Richard also points out, and this is in the case of what he calls desire, is there anything about the nature and extent of the organization's business activities that would cause you concern both in terms of risk and any personal ethical considerations? And that I think you really do have to pay some attention to uh, because um, it may not be obvious to you immediately that there are issues that are there. Um, sometimes the sheer size of a company, if you're on a large board, and I think either Mula or Richard alluded to this, there will be layers of complexity in which the board operates. There will be subsidiary operations, uh, which report to different other elements within the company. Um, that you may not be aware there may be matters that are taking place there at levels uh, that, that have not for whatever reason reached the board, but that can have enormous impact eventually on you as a director because the perception is going to be that you were a board member, you should have been aware or should have known. So you need to be very careful about that. Um, Again, um, these interlocking directorships and subsidiaries, I think, offer enormous uh, potential for um, personal liability to be imposed against you if you are not careful and aware of what those companies are up to or how they operate and function. Um, in short, I think. Um, the other view, and my last view, I think, on this is, I, again, and, and it may be because I am a, a lawyer, um, we, we do pay great deal of attention to um, who are the organizations or companies' uh, auditors. Uh, we look to them to provide guidance about the financial well-being of the company. But I often believe that we ought to pay a great deal of attention as to who are the attorneys for the company as well, because um, there are enormous issues that come up. And as I Mula has mentioned, a great deal of what you do face is crises management. And one of the issues that I think um, that um, isn't touched on a, a great deal on, um, on boards is how much uh, media training is given to board members to deal with crises. Uh, because if you are the chair of the audit committee or the chair of the social ethics committee or chair of the risk committee, you may well be asked uh, by the media in circumstances that are dire given a crisis that has occurred within the company uh, to address those kinds of questions. And you really do need to have some better understanding of how to manage a crisis. And a great deal of that is something that law practices 
can offer uh, some guidance on. So I think in summary, uh, my sense of this document is that it is an extremely uh, important guideline. It is something that um, I wish I had known about in earlier stages in my career as a director or whether as a non-exec or as a exec director. It's a, a useful document for anyone, whether you are an organization or an individual to, to have, have sight of. And um, I guess I'll turn this back over to Anton and thank you very much for the opportunity to, to talk to you from the perspective of an individual who looks at joining a board. Thank you, Milad, and thank you, Muller, and also to Richard. Um, wonderful insights, really great advice and valuable advice, I'm sure, for all those on this, um, on this, this forum this morning. And um, for those of you who haven't, haven't downloaded the, uh, the paper, um, I'm sure you know how to get onto the IOD's website. If you go to forums on the IOD's website, you'll then see all the papers that um, the um, Board Governance Forum have, have put together. And obviously the due diligence paper is, is there for you to download. We're going to go to questions um, from, from all of you. Um, I see we have, we do have, um, I see it's also posted now by, by the IOD in the chat box. So if you want to go there and download it, you can as well. Um, We've got a couple of questions for, for the panelists. Uh, I have got a, so I'll, I'll bring a slightly different slant to some of these questions. I want us to make sure that we're answering questions that are relevant to, to what has been, been spoken about this morning. Um, if we don't get to all the questions, uh, I'm sure you will get back to you via, via email or other means to ensure that we answer that question that you've asked. Um, and as I say, if there are questions that are not, that relevant to this discussion, I'll kind of put them down at the at the bottom end, and hopefully we'll get to them a bit later on. I I, I, th I see one question Muller deals with uh, the technical skills that Richard actually mentioned earlier on, or not you know kind of getting that blend of skills right. And I just wondered, you know, with regard to that that it was more statement on the on the Q and A um, um, section here. Uh, if if I if I need to possess domain skills. Uh, and expertise to position myself to be a board member, and maybe link that as well to technical skills. I mean, how important do you do you see that? And and what should I be doing to actually to get those domain skills um, into my it's in my my skills arsenal, so to speak? Thanks, Anton. Um, I think it really depends on your functional expertise. So. Um, the most typical domain skills on most South African boards, um, and that's you know another debate, is most South African boards have a plethora of chartered accountants on them. And so um, if you look at it in that sense, your domain expertise would clearly be your technical qualifications as a chartered accountant. Um, in addition to that would be ideally having worked as a CFO in an organization. Um, and then having planned your career such that you've moved from small organizations to bigger organizations, uh, which demonstrates your ability to deal with scale and complexity. Um, and being a CFO typically allows you to sit on a board as an executive director of, of an organization. So if you use that as one example, um, you can then plan your career in the sense that you, you demonstrate that you have qualified with a technical, very sought after skill, you've then uh, leveraged your qualification practically. So you've run entities and managed their finances. Ideally, you've managed their finances in, in a complex environment. So it could be cross-border, multi-country, multi-geography. Um, and you've not just started at a technical level, but you've moved all the way up to the top. You've then had experience of working on the board and serving on the board as an executive director. Uh, and hopefully that then grows your toolkit of skills. Um, and then you can come onto a board having had your own experience that you bring on board to guide and support other executives. Um, I think there's a, sometimes a mistake that's made particularly by younger um, qualified chartered accountants who want to, I think, prematurely get onto boards. So you have the technical qualification, but you haven't given yourself enough time to operationally and practically exercise your your growth of your skill set in managing complex organizations, large organizations, cross-border businesses. 
Um, so I'd always encourage people to grow their domain skills and expertise, not just in a narrow fashion in terms of just your technical qualification, but broaden it and work in complex organizations so that when you actually join the board, you get there with a lot of credibility. You've seen what can go wrong. You've got your own scars of things that you can share with your fellow board members and the executive team. Um, so I have a lot of, and I don't mean to be ageist, but I have a lot of 40 year olds who typically may have a technical qualification who want to position themselves onto boards. And I tend to be the person to say no, uh, not that I don't want you to succeed, but I really want you to set up yourself to have a very wide skill set, have a toolbox that you can really pick from in terms of helping organizations panel beat themselves and repair themselves. Um, because typically when you join an organization um, in any shape or uh, in any role, either at the executive level or board level, there's a problem to be fixed. So come to the board with your demonstration of the multiplicity of problems you fixed, the solutions you've presented. And I think then you really position yourself as a credible board member who has a skill set that's highly sought after. Um, one of the big skill sets that's now in vogue, I think, and, and, and real is that boards are beginning to build a technological capability at board level. You know, CIOs and CTOs are typically at executive level. We're now with COVID, particularly it's accelerated the number of boards that are looking at cybersecurity as a key risk around enterprise risk management at organizational level. Um, and that's an interesting one because I think that's going to play at itself out very interestingly in the sense that from a technical perspective, we have a view of what that skill set should look like. And so I think it's going to begin to change the shape of board composition um, because typically if you're old, gray haired, usually male and white, you kind of have the opportunity to kind of present yourself on a board. If you're younger and you, you, don't, you don't kind of over the age of 50, uh, people kind of question whether you really have the stature or the opportunity to present yourself onto boards. And I think this evolution into working from in a very strongly um, driven technological uh, era is going to begin to shape in, in, in a very interesting way how boards are composed, particularly when buying skill sets or procuring skill sets. Um, on the technological side of businesses, because you know we, we realize that you know it's a skill set that's typically not um, typical in the sense that you've worked for thirty years or forty years as a CTO or as chief financial officer. So um, two examples, I think, of where the skill set can either be long in the sense that you've grown it over many many years, or it's a newer skill capability that's needed in, in business that may not typically come in the box that we expect it to come in, uh, depending on what the organization is doing. I hope that answers the question. Thank you very much, Mula. Maybe just to, to add to that, um, while, we, while we've got you answering this question, Shadrach also kind of mentions in his, in his statement here that there's, you know, the, obviously looking at, at gender, at age, and you've mentioned that race is obviously key, nationality where necessary. Um, but how do you, as a search, as a as a sort of search executive search company, how do you get that balance right for your for your clients? I mean, what do you look at to, to ensure that you get the messaging to the uh, to the client to say, you know, you you've got to get your balance balance right? They may say this person's got all those domain skills, technical skills, or what have you, but then they don't actually fit the balance of the board. Anton, it's a very interesting question. You know, twenty years ago, I mean, I'm probably giving away my age, but 20 years ago, it was a lot harder in my field to present um, uh, not as tried and tested, um, capable um, and experienced and qualified board members. I think the view was very much that um, race, age and gender were, were, were uh, pre-qualifications. Um, and I think it's, it's become significantly easier, not, in, not, not very easy, but significantly easier to begin to have a broader conversation with board chairman, particularly around inclusivity. Um, inclusivity, just in terms of how do you broaden the dialogue on the board so that you're not really having a board, typically South African boards have a lot of chartered accountants on those boards. So how do you create a diverse board and, and diverse, not in the South African typical definition of race and gender, but diverse board in terms of upbringing, um, um, uh, perspectives, um, culture, um, and geographical, um, just, you know, geographical um, and, and nationality, different nationalities. South African boards typically are 90% South African. Uh, we have, I think, a very different view of how we, we qualify international. 
So a lot of South African boards, when they say we have international board members, they're typically from the West. Um, we don't have many boards that have international board members that deliberately go and look for Africans that may not be South African to serve on their boards. And that for me is always a bit of a misnomer because where most South African companies are growing into is into the continent. So you would think that it's in your interest to be able to invite board members that may be Kenyan or Ghanaian or Cameroonian to sit on your boards if that's where you're willing to grow and to grow the commercial uh, performance of your organization. And that in itself brings this whole issue of inclusivity. So it's not just inclusivity in terms of race and gender, but nationality of expertise, of skills, of perspectives, um, so that we begin to, I think, create diverse boards that are able to guide management as they begin to foray their terrain of investing on the rest of the continent. So uh, 15, 20 years ago, it was very difficult to have those conversations. I think it's becoming, it's a, it's becoming known that this is actually an advantage rather than a disadvantage to have a board that does not look typically the way that boards have looked before. Great, thank you very much. Wonderful answers. Um, maybe Millard to you, there's, um, and, and by the way, I see a lot of, a lot of discussion on the, chat, on the chat box. You know, you're welcome to follow that discussion. I also see a few hands up, but I will be going through some of these questions first and then we'll get to the, the hands a bit later on. And if there is time, we'll, we'll consider what has been included in the, in the, in the, uh, the chat box as well. Um, Nisha Singh talks about the, you know, the, this criteria that we've been, we've been speaking about this morning and how that measures up against some of the, the recent failures of uh, significant boards that uh, we've seen um, uh, not, 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 too, uh, not too long ago, the failures of Steinhoff, Tongot, Hewlett. Um, and, and a lot of those directors having those exemplary records required for them to become board members. I'm going to link this, Milot, if you don't mind, to, to another question. Well, another part of this question is also if, if those, those board members have now been replaced on those, on those particular boards of those companies we've mentioned, um, if, if, if after, for example, joined that board now with, with certain skills that I can help this organization get itself out of the trouble it's, it's been in, uh, would I potentially then be liable for the behavior that occurred before I became a board member? So sort of two angles there, if you, if you don't mind, Milot. Uh, thank you, Anton. A um, great deal of that depends on the issue and the timing of the issue and how long uh, the issue has been percolating within uh, the understanding of the board. So if I can unpack that by simply saying, if you join a board today and an issue that happened yesterday has come up, um, or like, let's, if you join a board today and an issue is 10 years ago and you were not a party to it, you had no understanding of it, you are not going to be particularly liable for or exposed on that particular issue. If the issue is one that happened 10 years ago, you joined the board, you've gone to several board meetings where the issue has been discussed, where the understanding of what's involved is there and you've done nothing uh, about that, potentially you could be exposed. Um, so I, I think it, there are, I think it's Article 76 of the Companies Act, which gives you a breakdown of the kinds of things that you can do to indicate that you have in good faith done what is required of a director to be knowledgeable about what has transpired in the past. And it exonerates you to some degree from being potentially liable for, back, for, for uh, activities that, that, have, that have occurred uh, in, uh, in the past in which you may not have been involved with. But it is a, an extremely important question to understand and consider. And if I can just elaborate for a second on that, uh, one of the problems I think I've seen on some of the boards I've set and other boards that I know of is that, again, you don't see that, you can't see that by going through uh, the annual report or board records. And that is, how does it actually operate when you're sitting around the table? Because what then happens around the table is, depending on the nature of the individuals who are there, and depending greatly uh, uh, as well on the chair, you can get some one individual who dominates conversations either by force of personality or by their eloquence as a speaker, 
who makes it very difficult for someone who is less articulate to be able to put forward his views or her views. And so they tend to um, accept the view of the dominant personality. Uh, I can recall being at meetings where uh, when we went in just before we were going in, I was told the one thing that I should not do is don't ask any questions. Well, that's about the worst piece of advice anyone could give a prospective board member because if there's anything you should do as a board member is ask questions um, because it's the why are we doing this? The why that has this happened? What is this all about? When did this happen? Are critical questions for you as a board member to interrogate constantly, whether it's of the other members of the board, if you're a new board member, or management to the extent that there are executive directors there as well. So I, I think um, if someone is joining a new board, there are questions that are lingering from the past. You need to unpack those as much as you possibly can, make your views known on those issues, and try and interrogate to the extent possible a resolution that is in the best interest of the company. I hope that helps. Yep, thank you very much. Um, Richard, a question for you, um, and I'm going to just twist this a little bit from Ibrahim. Uh, it, it, he talks about you know, the tips that the, that the panel can offer and how to detect an ill-intentioned colleague on the board, whether either executive or non-executive, new or existing, and how can one manage such board members? So, so we've all gone through your paper, or the BGF's paper. Um, we followed it to the T. Um, we've now appointed a, a, a director to the board, only to find out that this director now has, uh, has a hidden agenda or certainly another agenda. What do we do? Thanks, uh, Anton, a very interesting uh, question. And uh, I guess the, uh, my response for the angler I'd want to come at this from is more around from the chair perspective. Uh, let's say you have somebody on the board that uh, you believe is, uh, or it could come you know, from a, another board member, but you, you look at this individual and it plays a little bit back, back to uh, perhaps what Millard said around <clears throat> what are your legal duties as a director? And certainly as a chair, I mean, what was, is always in the back of my mind is, uh, you know, the so-called, uh, well, not so-called, the business uh, judgment rule. So we need to make a decision, you know, as a board, each director needs to contribute to that decision. And uh, in terms of the business judgment rule, I mean, one of the aspects besides the, the first one, make an informed decision, is do we have a reasonable basis for belief that this is a rational business decision in the best, in best interests of the organization? And what I find often plays out that you can test or you think about that in relation to what a director said, and particularly if they are a stakeholder representative, have they actually uh, worn the right hat or are they wearing the right hat in the, uh, in the boardroom? Are they making the decision in the best interest of the organization or are they playing to some possibly political agenda, and when I say political, it could be, I mean, I'll give an example, say on a medical aid scheme, are they playing to a, a, a particular uh, stakeholder, the constituency that uh, appointed them? And, uh, you know, as a director, or particularly as, say, as chairman, you probably have more, you do have more power and influence to say, you know, we need to be aware as directors that this decision needs to be made in the best interests of the organization. So that's at a high level, that's in the, uh, the boardroom, just to put the directors, so to speak, on terms that uh, this is what they're required to do in law and remind them of uh, that point. If it, you know, persists and you, you, you really realize that uh, this director is going down that, uh, uh, rabbit hole, so to speak, then as the uh, chair of the board or chair of the, uh, the relevant committee to actually sit down with the uh, director and if they uh, the inexperienced or even if they experience and point out, you know, as the chair, you're responsible for the effectiveness of the board and sit down with that director and perhaps have the conversation and say, I realize where you come from. 
I realize you're entitled to put views on the table, you're entitled to put strong views on the table, but at the end of the day, this is where we are, you know, from a legal and governance best practice uh, perspective. You need to ensure that you and ultimately the board make decisions that are in the best interests of this uh, organization. And whether, you know, I've quoted business judgment rule, but whether you're looking at uh, public sector law or uh, private sector, the, uh, the issues are, are the same. You need to make your decision in the best interests of the organization and not bring in the uh, uh, ulterior motives. You can put the views across and say, holding company thinks this, or, uh, you know, my constituency uh, feel very strongly about so-and-so, that's fine. But at the end of the day, I mean, the law is clear in this regard. So it's up to either as a director, if you're not the chair, to raise it and say, Chair, with respect, you know, this is what I feel, or if you don't do it in the, uh, the boardroom, to actually uh, raise it with the Chair, either through board evaluation or directly with the Chair and say, uh, I'm uncomfortable, you know, that one of the directors is pushing down a route that uh, takes us away from focus on what is the best interest of the organization. Thanks, Richard. And I, and I also think on, on that point, you know, it's it's also a role for the, the lead independent together with the chair. Uh, I'm not suggesting, and I don't know where Ibrahim, if he was suggesting this was a dissenting direct or someone who's just up to mischief. Um, but uh, always have as as the chair, have your have your lid with you in those in those discussions. So you've got some sort of backup um, to make sure that the the, uh, the right messaging gets across to that particular director. I notice uh, there are quite a few discussions going on in the chat box and some questions. Don't forget, if you're going to post your question, put them in the Q&A, which is on the left of the of the chat, the chat box. Um, pleasure, everyone. Thank you. Uh, and there's a question here, uh, Muller, from from Solly. Um, and I think it is something that's that, and certainly when when Richard spoke about Zondo, I think some of that came through through from the Zondo Commission as well. Uh, and Solly says in the past. Board membership was per invite on the basis of your known track record, your expertise, etc. These days, people are applying for these board positions. And could this be the reason for some of the poor performances that we've seen on certain boards, especially in SOEs, uh, and board members behaving like employees rather than being that oversight body? And, and I, you also mentioned this in your, in your answer earlier. So let me just give a bit of insight to Solly, please, Muller. Uh, thanks, Anton. So, Solly, unfortunately, I don't do much work in the public sector anymore uh, from a board perspective. So my answer is probably going to be quite dated. Um, I think one of the, the areas that I think is an area of, of opportunity for, for government in terms of building um, effective boards is their ability to scour and find the best qualified, most available, unconflicted and capable board members to serve on our state-owned entities. Um, I think somehow the process of applications, um, I think is, is let, me, let me answer it this way. If I look at the work that we do at executive, executive level, so typically when you put an advert out for a chief executive of a listed company, um, you're not gonna get the best responses for a start. And the right people who should be doing the job are not going to respond to an ad. So the quality of applications or responses you get for significant roles um, is always, um, it's, it's worrying, to, for lack of a better word. So you really want to go out and give yourself the ability to find the best, uh, regardless of where they may be in the world. Because I think our state-owned entities are very distressed. I think we need to find the best skill wherever we find it. I think we need to build diverse boards where the skill set um, for, for the for particularly for state-owned entities in crisis, that it does not predispose that all the board members are South African. Yes, we are a South African country with South African problems, but the solutions we need are probably going to be imported from other places until we get ourselves out of a very difficult spot. So to answer your question, I think the application process is a risk. Um, I think the nomination process is probably a risk. I'm not saying you should stop it, but I think it should be, it shouldn't be the only way that people get onto boards. It can be one of the channels. And the application process is typically there by government for transparency to show that that state on entity went to market and opened up the opportunity for people to put their names forward. So I think that's only but one channel, but it cannot be the only channel. I think the government really needs to 
to, to open itself up to find the best skills. And I sometimes wonder for myself, when you see some of the people that have been nominated, the level of due diligence that's actually gone into assessing whether they're the right people. Uh, sometimes you see names come up and you know from a reputational risk perspective that these may be politically exposed individuals, that these individuals may not have the right track record. Um, and we talked earlier with Anton and, and, and Millard um, and Richard about the fact that just basic due diligence around social media will give you so much information about is this the right person to be employing onto this board? If this is what they do in their personal time, if these are their views that they post on social media. Um, and I think there needs to be some level of independence in being able to scour and find the best qualified, non-conflicted, available, competent with a toolkit that can help our distressed state owned entities uh, transform themselves. And then if you then add on the applications, well and good, but then you've actually given yourselves many opportunities and different channels to try and find the best qualified people. You know, it's like I have a, and this for, for the academics on this call, I, I really don't mean this pejoratively, but I always wonder sometimes where you have a commercial entity that's there to run, to run a commercial business and most of the board are academics. So there's a place for theory um, and I'm not saying don't employ academics. I'm not saying that at all, but you need a skill set that's a composite skill set of men and women that have run complex organizations that understand the operational requirements of running a complex organization. And then you can add the specialists that are technical, uh, but the bigger the pool is, the more diverse the pool is, the bigger the skill set is, the better it is for us to build competence boards that can then support competent executive members. You know, and then we have this, this challenge again in South Africa where you find if your board in the public sector is not a particularly competent one in terms of skills and expertise, then you tend to not hire a competent executive team. So the two really go hand in hand. And I think we have a great opportunity to, to hire grade. Um, and let me not say this is a public sector issue. We have many pri private sector uh, challenges in this country. And I think some of them have already been named of companies that have have spectacular own goals, not just in South Africa, but with global repercussions. I agree, and and I, I think Mula also, also the the um, maybe the messaging oh. should be out there, not only to, to to government, but but to others as well. That uh, you know follow the paths that the IOD suggests. I'm not saying everybody should be a chartered director, but there are there are ways to skill up if you aren't if you don't have all those skills, particularly being put into a position. That you yourself could be could you know could find uh, a bit daunting uh, once you've you've taken on that that particular role. Um, so it, that's just a suggestion, but a selling point here for the IOD. But I, you know I do think you know the IOD does provide that that basis for for knowledge and 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 various other other angles to to kind of get that knowledge. So thanks, for that. Yeah. And I think Anton, sorry, if I may as well, I mean, there's an opportunity as well to, to, to fast track the development of new and independent board members onto boards. So there's an opportunity to mentor them. So if, you, if there's somebody who is new onto a board, um, there, there are great opportunities to really get the more senior developed directors to work very closely with the younger directors, to get them to, to be effective faster. Because we know from research that the first three years, uh, newer board members, if it's in their first boards, are not highly effective and not highly impactful. So if you've got a nine-year tenure on a board, it means usually between year three and year uh, nine is where you know they begin to get a return on their investment in terms of having you on the board. And I think we need to look at alternative ways because there's also great opportunity to get more experienced board members, some of them whose tenure is coming to an end, to begin to work more closely operationally on that board with the younger ones who have the technical expertise but may not have the length of board experience. Um, and I think uh, it, there's a, a big opportunity for chairmen of boards to begin to also grow that skill set because usually you get the same names over and over again. And so then you run into issues of conflict and availability. And I think in South Africa, particularly when we're trying to broaden the skill set and the pool set, we have to then begin to think creatively about how when you are sitting on a board, you actively have programs in place where sitting board members begin to work with the, the younger ones, not younger in terms of age, but maybe less experienced from a board perspective, 
because there's high levels of EQ, how you interact in the subcommittee, um, how you engage with the executive team. We tend to find the younger, technically experienced board members, but that may not have such a long tooth on the board, sometimes can be quite adversarial in dealing with the executive team. And so some of the softer issues that are culture and style can really be managed through mentorship of, of, of more experienced board members working with those that are, that are gonna be great in the long run, but let's try and kind of concertina the one to three years of them attending and not necessarily contributing and get them off the ground faster. And maybe just if I can switch, Mel, I'm gonna to switch to you. I saw a comment there from, from Shirley Morland on you know, the notion that uh, directors who, who sit on the board must now be mentored might be, might be offensive to them. Uh, I mean, in, in your experience, how, how, would you, how would you convince a, 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 it's a newly appointed director, not necessarily a young director, uh, how would you convince them to, to take heed of, of someone who's, who's slightly more experienced in the game of, of being a director? Anton, is that directed to me? Yes, it is. Sorry, Mila. Yeah, please. Sorry, we broke up just a bit. I wasn't clear. Um, um, well, first, any every board should have a induction uh, process whereby uh, new directors are informed of and given a better understanding of how the company itself works and how the board itself functions. So that's one important part of it. And one of the things that I certainly have found to have been helpful in my own experience is to participate in boards uh, in induction sessions for new board members. Um, that has not only been, I think, helpful for, for new board members, but helpful for me as well. But secondly, going to the point, I think, of your question, which is how, does, how do you approach someone uh, and mentor them who is a fairly senior figure already in their own career or who have made major contributions and either may not feel a need for it or feel uncomfortable asking. I think that's the question you're, 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 you've put to me. Um, first of all, I think mentoring is extremely important because one of the things that, um, and Mula touched on this, and it's, a, it's an issue I think that we really ought to explore or unpack in some form or fashion as to its implications. And that is that the vast majority in my experience um, the vast majority of boards in South Africa are not only dominated, but heavily dominated by chartered accountants. And as a consequence, there is a line of thought, a way of thinking, uh, an ideology, you almost can say, about how to approach issues that is reflective of that kind of background and experience. If you're not a chartered accountant, it's extremely important to be able to have opportunities to sit down with members on the board and better understand how a charter accountant sees uh, issues uh, so that that is because more often than not, it's the way in which issues are put before the board that dominates the way in which the board unpacks the issue. And generally, they're being put forward by the, the board members who are accountants. So I think it's extremely important to be mentored. I think no matter what your experience is, um, it's important to, to, particularly if you're joining a board for the first time, and it's a board that's of some complexity and not necessarily in an industry, industry sector that you know something about, it is important to spend time with, with, with board members as much as you possibly can. Now, some board members are very good at coaching because that's just their nature. Anton, I can tell, and Richard, both of you, uh, I, I can sense that that's something you do as a regular basis. So it would be easy for you, Mula uh, as well. Other directors are not able sometimes to be able to impart that kind of insight because they're just simply, they have skills, but they're not very good at translating those skills or offering those skills to someone who's new. Um, and, and finally, one other thing that, I, well, I have the, 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 um, the floor, if you will, that uh, Mula touched on, which I think is, again, another area of such importance, um, and that is um, IT. Um, and I remember being on one of our boards saying that 
the biggest problem we have at this board is there's no one in here who understands IT, no one in here who understands what's going on down the hall with the IT sector. Um, we just simply don't have that kind of expertise. And I think rightfully so, Mula has pointed out that increasingly that's going to become a greater demand and uh, will offer some additional insights about how boards are structured and how boards will function. Great, thank you. And I, and I think also, I mean, I, I, I did see that this, uh, the mentoring point is, has, uh, you know, there's, there's quite a bit of discussion around it on this, on this panel, on this chat. Um, I think it's also a personal thing for, for, if I want to be a mentor, you know, do I look in within the board? Do I look for someone that, that is a strong director outside of my, outside of my board to avoid any conflict, to avoid any kind of group think that is not, not uh, suitable to my, my sort of way of doing things. Um, but I, I, I I really, I, I, same as you, you know, I, I believe in mentoring and mentoring doesn't necessarily mean that you've been belittled in any way or form. Yes. It means that you're growing and you're listening and you're learning and you're asking questions. So you're asking those intellectually naive questions of your, of your mentor to make sure that you're better informed to do the job that you need to do. But like I say, if, you, if you're uncomfortable in asking a board member on the board that you sit, then seek out someone independent of that of that particular board but has the has the necessary expertise or the institute of directors correct absolutely and and like richard has said there's a there's a great paper on on mentoring um so please download that as well i'm sure someone will post it shortly from the iod on the chat um we have 15 minutes left uh, i'm going to try and get through a couple more questions um the one the one I will ask is, is maybe I'm going to ask you, Richard, uh, if, and this is from Nosisa, what should the ratio be between employer or sponsor appointed employee elected board members or trustees versus non-executive directors and or independent trustees with a view to board effectiveness and efficiency? Yeah, again, uh, <laughs> I reflect, I saw the, uh, the question in the, uh, in the chat and thought about it. And it really comes down, you know, the, again, the way I would respond to it. I mean, if you, you look at the principle and uh, around board composition and the principle deliberately was set to the high level and is very flexible and says you need a balance. And uh, there are no ratios. King has not put in uh, suggested charters or ratios. Uh, I think in King 3, uh, you know, we pushed for, when I say we, King 3 pushed for more independence on boards. There was criticism uh, of that, that you've got too many independent people, but they don't understand the core business. So how effective is your, uh, your board? You need people who really understand the, the business. And that's why, as I say, if you look at that uh, principle uh, 7 in King, it says, look at the balance and try and ascertain bringing all these uh, uh, aspects together, the skills, knowledge, experience, the level of independence, and that should guide you. You know, it's very difficult to say, well, you've got to have 50% or whatever. I mean, uh, people ask the question, you know, with gender representation and uh, how many, uh, you know, uh, females on the board and, you know, we've got to, well, you know, it's, there's evidence now that if you've got a third, that's significant enough to uh, uh, provide the level of influence you, you want on the board in terms of overall uh, thinking. So say, I'm, I'm not giving a particularly definitive answer because it comes back to thinking about your board, the balance on the, uh, the board at a point in time. And, uh, you know, King has been very much of the view that uh, it's a trade-off between do you need these skills? Uh, I listened to Millard, you know, the, uh, uh, the uh, aspect that comes up over and over again, do we have IT skills? Do we have uh, sufficient uh, uh, other skills? And one needs to actually, as I say, look at the board holistically, look at the, uh, the metrics, or create a matrix and say, well, how do we believe we're going to achieve uh, balance? The other thing I would mention that I've seen come through in board dynamics, you know, with employee, employee representatives or employer representatives on certain types of uh, boards 
is then perhaps the degree of commitment where, you know, I've worked for the chair who says you must realize a lot of these people don't particularly want to be on the board and the employer told them sit on the board or they've been elected or they've been elected by a member organization. We haven't got the degree of commitment that you probably see in other companies. And again, this plays to the, the board culture that you, uh, uh, you know, is prevalent on certain boards. And as I say, you see it uh, differ from, uh, you know, uh, different types of boards, as I say, where you've got perhaps a, uh, a non-profit that's got industry rep representatives on. Um, you know, how many should you have? And should you bring in some, what's useful there to bring in some independent th thinking, if possible, people who better understand the, the role of being a director? Often, uh, you know, generalizing, uh, you find... Uh, employer or employee uh, uh, representatives they put on and again do they have sufficient skills you know in order to be effective directors and if you look at the underpin of you know ethical today uh, one of the uh, key attributes is competence if you're not competent in other words understanding your decision should you uh, should you be on the board because you couldn't be ethical anyway so I haven't given a say a definitive answer. It's about balance. It's to critically look at what do you believe is best to drive your organization forward. And you've got to weigh all these things up uh, together. So independence is great. If you've got the wrong people, um, you're not going to go anywhere. Core business is what you need. Maybe they aren't independent. Uh, so I hope, I mean, that answers your, uh, to some degree, answers your question in terms of uh, trying to find the, the balance. I can't put numbers to it. Thanks, Richard. Um, I'm going to ask Mula to, for you to start this, the, the answer to this question and then Mula to kind of pick up from your experience, particularly considering your, your business school background as well, uh, and, and answering Jeremy's question. and and. Jeremy says, you know, often the soft skills, and this is kind of bringing in, I suppose, the, the link here, we, we spoke about mentorship, the domain skills, technical skills, uh, and other skills, and then also diversity, not only in you know, your, your age diversity as well on the board to bring, bring new ideas to the fore, but he, he says you're often the soft skills, social competencies are overlooked in favor of hardcore technical skills, years of experience in industry, et cetera. Uh, this requirement, often disqualifies potential new directors wanting to gain the necessary experience. Um, how does the nominating committee then build this into the develop, the, the sort of developmental aspect um, of the recruitment process? So for example, you could be a certified director or charter director, but not have those 10 to 15 years of experience that, that might, might be deemed necessary on a board. I mean, a lot, of, a lot of boards, a lot of nominating committees often just go for the experience and forget about the, the rest of the diversity required on that particular board. So Mula, if you can pick it up from your search point of view and then Mula, from your experience, um, kind of bringing it, bringing it in from the, from the, the um, let's say the candidate's perspective. Thanks, Anton. I'm not sure I understand the question. So when they say the social skills, what are we referring to? Well, I suppose what, what Jeremy is saying is that, that often the, the softer skills, social competencies are overlooked in favor of hardcore technical skill. Um, so how do we get that balance? You know, how does an honoring committee get that balance right to, and, and develop directors into the positions that they needed in the future? Okay, okay, fair enough. So I think from our perspective, um, there's two things we look at. So uh, if I put into two big buckets, the one is the technical expertise and, and the very things we've talked about, domain experience, et cetera. The other one is the EQ. And um, I, I could also talk about social skills in terms of stakeholder management. So how do you play with the other kids in the sandpit? So are you the one who takes all the toys and runs away? Do you share? Are you able to manage conflict? Um, and so style becomes a particularly strong competency, I think, of trying to build uh, trusting, diverse, uh, robust boards where that level of dialogue is done in a very respectful manner. So a lot of the work that we do just in terms of assessing um, the suitability and the cultural fit of somebody to get onto a board, the, the hard core, you can kind of you know, enumerate the number of years, the technical expertise, the domain 
expertise is just the first level of due diligence. The second level of due diligence then looks at that, that person's, um, for lack of a better word, I shouldn't say humanity, but how they're likely to integrate into the board. So their style, um, how they work under pressure, how they deal with conflict, how they're able to influence, how they're able to negotiate, how they're able to work in a diverse environment um, that is not just representative of what is comfortable for them. And so those, uh, I don't know if those are the social skills you're talking about, but those are the kinds of competencies outside of just the stock standard, you qualify the GCT or an actuary. Um, it becomes, I think, a very critical success factor at senior leadership levels that you're able to attract and place men and women uh, who are in very powerful decision-making abilities where their EQ and their SQ is significantly developed, where you're able to self-correct, where you're able to admit that I made a mistake, where you're able to take on um, input that's different to yours, um, where you're able to admit what I called earlier on your scars. So I, I made this mistake many years ago, but this is what I learned from it. Um, and I, we find, I think, when you have men and women that are not able to take on input that's dissimilar to theirs, that tend to be quite dogmatic, sometimes those come across as the ones that create a lot of tension on boards because it's my way or the highway. And I think part of our job is to really try and find uh, qualified men and women, not just technically, but culturally, um, and those that really have been stress tested in in how they work with others when things are not working well, which is why I raised the issue of stress earlier on and of crisis management. Because I think when, when we're put under stressful conditions, that's when our true sense comes out. And I think that's when you begin to differentiate between those that have high EQ and SQ, that when times are tough and boards are having to make very difficult decisions and support their executive in making difficult decisions, that the emotional maturity is there um, in, 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 in working and building a board that's collaborative, that's trusting, but that's also open and transparent. And then I'd also add one that's very respectful. Um, and I think when I talk about respect in, sorry, Anton, in closing, I think one of the, the, the chats I saw said, you know, they, they're not sure about mentorship. And so for me, I always look at mentorship in a different way. And maybe the word mentorship maybe makes people feel uncomfortable. I think becoming an effective board member um, that journey is an apprenticeship journey. So whether you find, you know, you learn through watching, you learn through experience, you learn through watching others do it. And I think a lot about it is not so much the what, but it's the how. And I think to become an effective board member, and Anton, to your point, that mentor or that apprentice that you're going to feel comfortable to work with can be outside of your board. But I think the culture of dialogue and discourse and, and developing and maturing as a board member is not something that we are born with. I think it's something you grow over time and with experience. And even in your senior executive career trajectory, none of us gets there ready-made. We have a senior manager that we learn from and can ask them comfortable questions from who will then help us grow. And I think it's no different when you get to board level. I think sometimes we think that just because you are technically qualified and you have the skill set that you can actually do the job. And so uh, in a roundabout way, that social um, competence um, also is gained at senior board level through a mentorship apprenticeship process, I think. Great, thanks, Will. And maybe just very briefly, I mean, do you, do you try and convince your clients to take, to take a view as you just, as you just mentioned? So they, they come to you and they say, this is the kind of person we need. Do you have a holistic view of what the board is currently, kind of the diversity on that board? Uh, and then convince your client to say, well, let, let's just let's just revisit what you want and, and maybe look at it at, at a slightly different angle. I, I definitely. I mean, sometimes I think I'm not the best headhunter in the sense that um, I always push the boundaries with my clients. I always say, let's look at this from multiple perspectives. Um, how about this? Have you thought about that? Um, I, you know, this is my perspective. Ultimately, it's their decision. But I think as a strategic advisor, it's our job to be able to, to push the boundaries. It's our job to be able to share uh, different lenses with our clients because we work across so many different clients. Um, and at the end of the day, they will say yes or no, ultimately, but it's definitely our job to, to, to make them see things differently. And I think one of the advantages is because you work with leaders across so many sectors and industries, 
you, you have the ability and the opportunity to influence and to, and, and sometimes Anton, when they don't really agree with me, because sometimes the spec is on paper, one of the things I suggest is I say, you know, go and meet Millard for a cup of coffee, have a non-committal conversation with Millard, uh, get to know him, go and meet Richard for a cup of coffee, and then let's have a chat afterwards, because I know I've taken you somewhere that you really didn't want to go to in the first place, but let's, let's have a dialogue between two humans that come from different perspectives, and let's see how that could add a different dynamic to your board. Um, so don't assume that that conversation is going to commit you to getting them onto your board, but I, I'm pretty confident that that conversation is going to have you think differently and think laterally, and I think that's what our job is to do. Great, thank you. Milan, then uh, from your perspective, the, the candidate's point of view on, on that particular question. Um, well, thank you. I think Mula has done such a brilliant job in explaining some of the kinds of ways in which one goes about developing the emotional um, IQ that's necessary, the soft skill that's necessary to serve on a board that I would only be repeating what she's had to say. But I, I think the other thing that's important to appreciate for those who are thinking about joining a board is that when you go onto a board, these aren't your best friends. These aren't your, your family. These are not people you're gonna see every day. These are people you're going to run into once a quarter if, it, if you have four meetings a year. Um, you have virtually no other engagement with them. So your social skills do become important. If you're entering board, a board for the first time, uh, and let's assume you're a woman, and it's been an all male board, that's an imposing kind of circumstance for you to face. And your ability to be able to break that down and to feel comfortable within it so that you can make the contributions you need to make uh, I think is comes from a lifetime, again, Mula has said, a lifetime of experience gained by being in stressful situations where you are comfortable in an uncomfortable space. So uh, the most important thing I think I want to add to this just in, in, in closing with it is that it is not a, we're, this is not a party when you join a board. This is not a group of great friends that you're going to be Sometimes you do develop friendships, and I have over the years, but that's not what you face going in. You're going in to join a group of people to determine what's in the best interest of the company. And many of those people have been there before you. They've got different views. They've got different perspectives. Um, they may have different understandings about how uh, matters should be dealt with. And your ability to be comfortable in that environment and make others un make others comfortable as well is a skill set that is extremely important for any new director. Thank you, my lord. Well, thank you, panelists. Um, I uh, I know we're on the we're on the hour now, 11, 11 o'clock. Um, I'm sure this discussion could have gone on for another two hours, based on the questions that we haven't got to, we haven't we haven't uh, managed to to tend. Uh, and also all the comments in the in the chat box. Um, I think there's some great insights as well that you've shared in that chat box. I hope Julie, you and your team have made notes of them. Uh, we will try and get back to those of you that have, that have asked questions uh, and get you get your answers either from the panelists or or, or from from the IOD. Um, but uh, again, thank you very much. And Julie, I'll hand over to you to close. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Anton, and to Richard Millard and Mula. You've had a fantastic discussion. Um, I've really seen such appreciation for your views and your comments and your frank um, experience shared within the, uh, the chat function. There were quite a few questions. We're going to try and get to them. Um, and uh, But I would like to, to um, hear from our audience, and that's why I've posted up um, the last slide with a QR um, code for you to scan and please share your, your feedback with us. And um, we look forward to chatting to you all again. We have another technical event coming up on the 16th of August, remuneration related. Um, and I will be posting information on that soon onto the IAD's website and through our bulk emails. But a big, big thank you to our panelists. It's really been a really enjoyable session um, and I, we couldn't have done it without you. Thank you very much. Goodbye, everyone. Have a great uh, week and um, yeah, have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye.